You know, as we get on uh, into Christmas season, uh, I don't know about you, but um, the sales are oftentimes off the hook. There's tons of things that are cheap and uh, um, a good time to buy things. Uh, so much so, in fact, that uh, you got to kind of triage the things that you want, right? Um, the things that you want to get for other people. Uh, one of the fun things about being a parent is that you actually get to shop for your kids again. And uh, shopping for toys is actually pretty fun. Now that I have like adult, you know, income, which I don't like go crazy, but um, finding deals on things for kids is, uh, is a particularly fun time of the year. Uh, I, th- I think my kids are not in here. I actually, I bought, I found this deal for um, these Lego toys that are normally like 25 bucks, but they're $5 free shipping. So I got like two of them. Uh, and I, I'm just going to give one to Colin, but I'm like, oh, I got an extra one. I got to find somebody to give it to. Uh, <laughs> right? um, and uh, however, in this season, really, I think the, the religious calendar, the, uh, the, the holy calendar, right? What is it that we remember in terms of, you know, what, what does this season remind us of in terms of the gospel? Um, it's really the incarnation. Christ has come to the earth. He has been born uh, like us, uh, human flesh, human nature, and he lived a life amongst us. And really what we're getting into in the, in the gospel of John is this deeper look into who is Jesus and why did he live? What was the significance and purpose of his life here on earth? And I want to, I want to, put this out to you before we even get into the message. It's easy and natural for us uh, to get quickly bored of Jesus Christ. Uh, John is spending a lot of time, attention, crafting detail, working in art, putting in irony, and just all kinds of of nuance to his gospel so that we might get a deeper, clearer, and more profound picture of who Jesus is. And I don't know about you, but the natural way that I think and, and work is... By the time I get to like chapter six or seven, I'm like, okay, so get to the point and you know, give me some lessons and some ideas. And I, I get frustrated with how much time and attention and how much uh, detail he puts into who Jesus is. But really at the core of the Christian life, I think this is John's view. This, is, this should be our view. God's will in shaping you and sort of showing you who he wants you to be is really, it's going to happen through the mechanism of knowing who Jesus is and imitating him. That's a lot of what the discipleship looks like in John. Look at who Christ is. Look at his life. Consider how God is is working in his life and leading him to self-denial, to to glorify him no matter what the cost. And disciples, look and imitate. Learn your own fate and future by examining Christ. And today as we look at Christ's mission, um, culminating now finally towards the cross, we see one of the deepest pictures of what it means to be a disciple of Christ because we get to see in Christ's own life what was his mission? What was his, his will in regards to, to, the will of God, uh, to the will of God the Father? How did he see his own life and, and how did he uh, understand the purpose of his life? Now, here's what I want to do for us. I'm going to give you a sentence and if you break up this sentence, you'll basically have the sermon outline. All right, so here goes the sentence. Uh, it's the THT. I, I bold this in every sermon, the take-home truth. If you have one sentence that's just like, I'm not going to pay attention to the rest of it, just give me a bullet, right? Here's the bullet. Uh, for the glory of God, you must forsake your life and replicate the life of Christ in others. All right, that's, that's the bullet. Hold that in your pocket and, you know, you don't even remember anything else. For the glory of God, right? Meaning this is the purpose of your life, to glorify God. You must forsake your life. Counterintuitive, paradoxical. You need to give up the prerogative to grow and flourish your own life. And third, for the sake of replicating the life of Christ in others. That there is a missional sharing in the life of Christ of growing life. And, and human flourishing in the life of others. For the glory of God, you must forsake your life and replicate, replicate the life of Christ in others. Um, here, as we look into the passage, uh, what's interesting is Greeks are coming to Jesus, and we read in that uh, call to worship, right, that when the nations inquire of the Messiah, you know the time has come. When the world is begun, beginning to be drawn to Christ as the banner that assembles all of his elect, when that time has come, you know it's the end. And John passes through it really quick. There isn't much time in terms of dialogue. There's not really much given in terms of explaining the significance of the Greeks coming. All that really happens is Jesus n- notes for his disciples and for the crowds, the time has come. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now you get to see what my life has been all about. 
And it's all pointing to the cross. The idea of, of glorifying God, what he's describing here is we get to see as clear as it's going to be the beauty and goodness and worthiness of God through the life of Christ. You know, that, that's why we exist, to know God, to glorify him and to enjoy him. Audrey asked me that, you know, my daughter asked me that just uh, a couple days ago, we were driving, and she, sometimes she just throws these like really strange, out of nowhere questions. She goes, so why did God make us, Dad? It's like, ugh, it's like, I'm dropping you off at school. It's going to be like 45 more seconds. And I said, uh, Westminster, right? Uh, <laughs> I guess, or what is it? Uh, yeah, Westminster, because Heidelberg is the other one. I said, uh, you know, the chief end of man. It's like, oh, I've got to explain what chief is. I've got to explain what end is. But the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So that means you've got to know who he is, worship him, and um, you've got to love what he does in your life and who he is. Uh, and she's like, okay. I could tell it was, like, it was an unsatisfying answer, but it was enough for her, and she shut up. Uh, but here's what happens, right? Christ, having come down to the earth, he is, for our sakes and to the glory of God, the perfect model of a man. This is what humanity is supposed to look like. This is what we are supposed to look like. He is not only an example for us, he is the true father of the new humanity. And in seeing him, notice how he sees his life. The Son of Man will be glorified. And why? What's the theme happening here? Because he will lay down his life in obedience to the Father's will to glorify the Father. That's what's happening. He will submit himself to death willingly to show the goodness and truth and beauty of God. And that's going to be shown out in verses 27 to verse 36, his prayer. He's not going to avoid the cross. This is his mission. He's not going to escape judgment. For this purpose I have come to this hour, to not be saved, to die. Now, here, uh, let, me, let me give you that first point. For the glory of God, our life exists for the glory of God. We must imitate Christ in this. The purpose, the significance, the, the driving goal of why you are here is to give God glory. Verse 23, Jesus answers them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, he is saying, it's my hour to shine. Seems a little Kanye, right? A little bit too self, uh, self-aggrandizing. But what he's saying is his hour of glory is his hour of greatest self-submission, greatest humility, greatest rejecting of his own prerogative and welfare for the sake of God. That is his glory. That is his shine, is to put the Father's will first. That comes very clear in his prayer. That comes very clear in the fact that he's going to the passion, to the cross. His hour of glory is his hour of total self-rejection and self-denial. The purpose and end of his life are, is going to coincide. You know, for a lot of us, we think the, the meaning and sort of the high point of my existence happens somewhere in the high point of your life, right? In, in the phase of your strength and youth and wisdom where it all comes together, right? You have energy to work and, and wisdom yet at the same time to do it well. And you're not super old so that you're, you know, debilitated, but you're not super young where you're just stupid. There's like a perfect time in your life to shine. For Jesus Christ, his shine time of life was his death. Because he's saying, that is my purpose, my mission, to die for you, to die for God's elect. The point at which the greatest revealing of true value and worth and beauty for Christ is going to be in his humility, his self-denial, his putting the will of God first. A ton of time uh, is spent on this in, in the Gospel of John. The purpose of Christ's life is not self-fulfillment filling, sort of self-working, climbing up of ladder of, of power and influence and prosperity it is not about growing his own life. His whole mission and purpose has been about and continues to be about serving the will of God in the lives of others and becoming nothing. Progressively more poor. Increasingly hated and misunderstood up into the point where it's going to mean death on a cross. It's a lonely, 
yet loving and life-giving existence that will end in this hour of glory, the great height of love and self-sacrifice, the great and agonizing death in order to save his people. Now, if we see where Christ takes this, he doesn't just leave this as kind of a, a Christological point. We could leave it at that and say, what a great Savior we have. But he applies this very clearly to his disciples. And, and notice how he does this. To his disciples, he says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. He makes it really clear here that his disciples are not just learners. They're servants. They're to do the will of their master, Christ. He's, in some ways, reorienting the nature of their relationship once again to be saying, you're not just here to get something from me. You are here to serve me. And in so doing, what he's making very clear, to be Christ's servant means we have to follow him. We have to copy him. We have to see his life as an exemplary model for our own life. And not only that, but and where I am, there will my servant be also. There is a, there's a kind of a dark uh, flavor to this. Because it's, uh, the disciples know, you're here in Jerusalem to basically be faced down to the death. And the disciples are really clear about this. So if we follow you, we might be dead too. That, that's as much as they say, right? Let's go with them to Jerusalem so that we also might be killed. They, they have this very pessimistic kind of view. And, and they're right. They know Christ is going to be killed. He's going to be opposed, conspired against. And so when Jesus says this, he's saying all of it is also yours. You're going to be hated in Jerusalem with me. And you're also going to be glorified when I'm vindicated. All that's yours. It's a sharing of his life and sharing his model and example. Now, what does that consist of? Here's the paradox. Uh, I had to actually make sure that I was using this term correctly. A paradox is a seeming contradiction, but it, it can turn out to be, uh, um, I don't know, logical or, or uh, reasonable. And in, uh, in the way that uh, writers in this day would use certain apparent paradoxes, it's called like a masal. <laughs> I know it's like misor, but it's a, it's a way of using an apparent contradiction to highlight a point. And, uh, and here, I think he's not exaggerating. He's saying there, the secret to Christian life doesn't make sense. It's not just taking worldly wisdom and getting more of it. It's not just learning how to live life and doing it a little bit better with Christian teaching. It's a complete contradictory way to think about why you exist. If you don't start from ground zero saying, I don't understand anything about why I live, God, teach me. It's, man, I don't know if some of you guys have tried to teach like Common Core or, you know, brand new ways of approaching, you know, problems. God's basically saying to us through Christ here, look, if you're going to learn how to live a Christian life, a life like Christ, you got to start from kindergarten again. And here's what it looks like. The way to life is self-denial, self-rejection. If you seek to save your life or, or to, to prioritize your life, to love your life, to, to make your life the primary goal of your life, you're going to lose it. It's going to slip away from you. You're going to be empty. But if you want to preserve life, if you want to keep life eternally, you've got to get your mind around the fact that you've got to give it up. It's giving it away that you retain it. Look at verse 24 to 25. He's saying, this is my life. Verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, get this clear. Initially, he's not talking about his disciples. He's saying, this is my life. Unless I die there are no other plants. There are, there's no other life. I am the one living seed in the world that when I die and give my life up, many seeds, many, much more life, much more fruitfulness will come. Unless I go to the cross, there is no crop. And catch the metaphorical depth here that John is doing. Christ having come down from heaven as this extra universe kind of life, this alien life into the world, that when he dies and submits himself, it'll be the source of multiplied life on the earth, 
us, disciples, Christians, those who trust in him. And what he's using here as an agricultural metaphor, you know, a plant's sort of goal is to get out of the ground and to live, right? To suck up nutrients and to eventually bear fruit. But a seed's purpose, its only purpose is to get buried, to fall off, to be scattered, to reproduce a plant with a similar nature and life to its own. Right? That's the whole, if, you, if a grain of wheat falls into the ground and goes down deep, it's going to produce not like apple trees. It's going to produce other grains of wheat. And so what Christ brings down and gives in terms of his own life, his own, his own blessed nature with God, what he's saying is, I'm going to share that very blessed life principle with my disciples. And he says, and you disciples are going to do the same. Again, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. That's going to be your life too. It's not going to be one of personal, sort of mechanical growth. It's going to be one where it feels to you like self-denial, submission, giving away. And the worldly side of you, and here's, here's where he makes this really clear, right? Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world We'll keep it for eternal life. He's saying the entire world system of self-promotion, self-aggrandizing, just constant work to increase your life. He says it's, it's counterproductive at its core because in pursuing that, you lose it. You see, Christ's mission is not just to come down and live a good life. It's not to grow in power just by winning people. He sees the point and purpose of his life, his human life, is to create a harvest of souls for God. The heaven-sent seed dying to produce hundreds, thousands, millions like himself, a new harvest on the earth, a fruitful earth that God reaps for his own glory. But here's what he explains. Death comes before life. Death comes before life. We see that even as parents, don't we? Uh, raising children costs something to somebody. It's a loss to somebody to have those kids, to raise them up every day of it, right? Uh, every way in which we produce life includes some kinds of self-sacrifice. And especially we see that true in the life of Christ, metaphorically here in the seed. Um, death comes before life. It's a counterintuitive, paradoxical way to live. Just a quick illustration. I, I remember when I was like maybe six years old, about Colin's age, one of my hobbies was digging holes in the backyard. It was super dumb. I, I don't know why I had hobbies like that. I would take a shovel from the, the garage and I would just dig a hole like three or four feet deep. And uh, you know, when I think back on that, it makes me realize, man, I was pretty unsupervised as a kid. <laughs> like, it, I guess it was just a different time in the 80s, right? It's like Stranger Things. Um, I would just dig holes. And uh, at one point, I remember I learned about plants and I was like, okay, I have... Uh, orange seeds, because I ate an orange, I dug like a four-foot hole, and uh, I put seeds all the way at the bottom. I had no idea what I was doing, and I watered some of it, and I, I put the, whole, the dirt back into the hole. It was about like a week and a half later, I got super impatient, and I dug the hole back up looking for those seeds, right? Because I was really curious, is it working? Does life actually happen like this? You know, is, is this how it works? And I dug all the way down, and I found those seeds again. And uh, the funny thing is, they were actually starting to grow. They were starting to have little threads of life kind of go out into the dirt. And so I covered it all back up and then they died. <laughs> because you're not supposed to dig up seeds, right? You're supposed to just let them grow, I guess. And I killed them by, you know, wanting to know what was going on there. Um, this is not a great illustration, but all that to really get to the point and say, um, when, it comes to, um, when it comes to growing things, the way you have to approach it as a farmer, as, as uh, one who's seeking to yield a crop, a lot of it's counterintuitive. You've got to wait. You've got to allow it to be gone, right? It's not something that you can just mechanically produce with time. It's something that you have to allow the process to take its course. And it's, it feels like just loss. And what he's saying here ultimately is Christian life is one that it is by faith, right? It's lived by faith. And here's, here's why it is. Because everything in your instinct and intuition is going to say, this is not how you improve life. You've got to make it happen for yourself. You've got to work hard and add those things to your life. Where Christ is saying, no, only God can add the truly good things to your life. You have to learn how to trust him and not do what is 
natural to your nature, which is just live for yourself. That's where the faith comes in. You have to trust that the only truly good things in life God can give you. And so you can be recklessly obedient when it looks like self-denial and loss. Imitating Christ in his death. The, the commentators on this passage note that, you know, the fact that this is so central to all the synoptic and, you know, to, to John, the fact that the idea of death as a means to serving God in obedience that leads to life, the, the self-rejection of a disciple, it's not just something that's an interesting point of, of the gospel. It's core to the idea of the gospel itself. They say it's in the nucleus of the gospel, self-denial as a way to live. So we move on from that and say, to what end? Uh, C.S. Lewis has said in um, Mere Christianity, you know, if you ask 10 people today what the greatest virtue is, many of them, maybe 9 out of 10, would say, I'm paraphrasing here, but 9 out of 10 would say unselfishness, right? Is to not put yourself first. But what he says is that's not a, a really good picture of Christian virtue. Because Christian virtue is not just stoicism. It's not just saying, don't do what you want and control yourself. Just be free of worldly desires and worldly lust. But he says the great Christian virtue you see in the New Testament is love. Self-denial as a means to bless and love others. That that is a great Christian virtue. And to self-deny in so much as and in so far as it helps and serves other people. But it's not just self-denial for the sake of self-denial. Which is why we don't just say be a monk, practice monasticism, give up everything and just learn self-control. You ought to have self-control. But the, the real Christian virtue here, the Christian pushes, it's self-denial as a means to replicate and grow life. Do you notice how Christ uh, describes this here? It's an interesting way to say it. He's, he's talking about himself initially. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, this is a strange way to say it, it remains alone. It's a lonely seed. If it dies, it bears much fruit. That's, that's the way he's presenting the idea of self-denial for discipleship, his own life. It's not just self-control. It's not just the virtue and selfishness. What he's saying is the very nature of what God is calling us to do is outward focused. It's others blessing and it's God serving it's denying ourselves in order, and I think this is the point here, to reproduce the life of Christ in other people. This is why Christ is dying, right? Is to not just sort of abstractly do God's will and deny himself. He is subjecting himself to death. Why? So that others may have life. To yield a harvest of fruitfulness. I had, I had to think about this. I don't think grains are, like, I don't think wheat is a fruit, right? Uh, I don't think it is. You can correct me on that. Uh, but what is he talking about here? To actually have something useful to the one cultivating that stuff. Meaning, if you think about the purpose of human life, it's not, you know, God's purpose is not simply to make you happy. You think about why we're saved and why he's created us. It's ultimately to bear fruit, to do something that he wants us to do, to live a life that actually has value to the Father in some way. Now, it's gracious, uh, we're purposed for grace and, and to be blessed even in that. But we are to do good deeds. We are to be serving God's interest to, uh, to do what he has created us to do, to rule over and bless and cultivate and flourish the earth. And ultimately, as it concerns yet in this age, to evangelize, to be on mission, to see Christ glorified in the lives of others, to see him trusted and believed and followed, to see his life become the acting and true principle in the life of other people. This is the greatest task, the greatest task, to see that, that heaven-sent life become the life in the souls of others. A seed's whole purpose is to reproduce life like its own, to make life like its own. Now, to be clear here, if you're tuning in with the passage and what Jesus is saying, he's not just calling you to just give up your dreams and give up your goals for the sake of it. We're allowed through wisdom, through stewardship, to actually manage your life, to do well, to save up, 
You know, you probably would have been smart if you invested in bitcoins a couple years ago. Too bad now, right? Um, and maybe it's still not too bad. Maybe you can still do it, right? Um, you can work towards your own flourishing, towards your family's health and welfare, towards the security of those you love. You can do all that kind of stuff and do it well, do it responsibly, do it excellently. But what he's teaching us is that self-denial is the primary way we cultivate the life of grace in others. It doesn't happen for free. It happens at personal cost. Uh, let me put it this way. Um, if you have thought to yourself, God has created me for a purpose in the life of others. He's called me to do something. He's called me to matter to some people. I don't know why, but I have influence. I exist in the life of others. He has created you to do that in such a way. He has called you to do that in Christ, like Jesus, meaning with pain, with suffering, with cost to yourself. All missions, all service to others is going to be in some ways sacrificial. It's going to be in almost every kind of way you not getting what you want and you blessing others for that purpose. And the help of this, it's not really a point here, but I think it's an important part. The help that we get in this is that and the grace of God honors you. Do you see that? Uh, we're not just left to give up and self-sacrifice and to self-deny and be left impoverished for it. Verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And honor in, in the scriptures doesn't just mean think well of. To honor your parents also means to take care of their physical needs and their, and their need in their old age. Meaning to honor somebody means to make sure that they're cared for, not just in your mind, but in actuality. So what he's, what he's saying here, that life of self-denial in God's gracious hands is not a risk. It's not really loss. If my son was willing to be generous with his toys and with all that he has, he's not really risking anything because I got him covered. If he gives his sandwich away to his sister because she's hungry, it's not like I'm going to be like, that was a really good deed, son. Well, dinner's in six hours, so <laughs> hang on till then. I'm going to take care of him, right? I'm going to make sure he's not going hungry. I'm going to, in fact, reward his generosity. Now, Jesus is not teaching here a kind of prosperity theology saying, so if you give $500, wait a couple weeks, and you're going to see $1,000, right? If you invest this much money to the church, just watch what happens as you know, the, the suits and Rolexes come rolling in. God's generous. What he's saying here is that God will be, sh will be sure to take care of your needs according to his grace and will. So don't fret. Don't worry. You can give up. You can do his will when it looks a little crazy. God is gracious to the whole world, but it's especially true of those Christians who serve Christ sacrificially. He'll take care of you. Let me apply this in a few ways for us. Um, the way that the gospel in the New Testament generally presents human flourishing as regards you know, human interaction, um, here's, here's the basic summary point. You cannot sustainably make yourself happy. That's, that's the issue. You cannot bless yourself. The greatest blessings in Christ, or the greatest blessings in life, come from the hand of another. The greatest things that you have are going to be gifts. Partly in the fact that you know, you're not able to bless yourself because your means are little, but also for the fact that the greatest things in life actually come as a result of love and not as a result of works. You guys get that? Let me, let me give you a couple examples here. You know, the peculiar way that God has wired us, you know, if you buy a nice meal that you worked hard for, there's some pleasure there. I know a lot of you guys like to eat and like to eat good food. Um, and if you create a good meal and eat it, there's some pleasure there, but it's like, I think it's not that great, right? Um, if someone buys you a meal because they love you or makes you a meal because they care about you, there's something richer to the food than just the taste. There's love right? It's, it's love food. You can't do that for yourself no matter how wealthy you are. You can pay people to make food for you, but you can't make someone do it because they're freely doing it because they appreciate you. It's receiving something because of love. There's a greater pleasure there. Here's another example. Uh, if you have an embarrassing failure, right, at work, you kind of humiliate yourself or you fail something that you really thought you were good at, 
Um, do you ever do this? You're driving home, you're giving yourself a pep talk, say, you know, saying like, you know, th- th- you're distracted, you didn't get good rest, you know, you just, like, they don't understand, they were not really responsive to you. There's all kinds of ways in which you give yourself a pep talk to sort of hype yourself out of the feeling that you're a loser, right? And whatever you do, there's something in the back of your mind that sort of says, yeah, but you're a loser, though. <laughs> like, you're like you, sh- you could have done better, you're just not good, right? Or, or you're, you're foolish, or that's the kind of guy you are. And you can't necessarily pep talk yourself out of your own doubt. But when somebody that you respect affirms you and gives you consolation and sympathy and says, this happens to all of us. This is not who you are. This is normal to life. There is a kind of deep health and comfort that you can't give to yourself. All of the greatest things in life comes as a result of grace in other people. The greatest things. Think about this. If you treat somebody well and they treat you well, if there's peace and human happiness because you've kept good relationship, there's, there's great happiness and joy to that. A lot of your friends, you know, maybe you've never fought with them, and there's still a lot of fun, there's a lot of enjoyment. But when someone else tells you, right, uh, when someone else forgives you after an inexcusable act of sin, Right? You've done something that you cannot work your way out of that hole. No matter how much you bless them or buy them gifts or apologize, you have hurt them for real. You're completely dependent upon that person to just release you. There's something that happens when somebody forgives you freely that cannot be compared to just keeping good relationships up by work. You experience a total addition to your life of love. There's profound gratitude and humility that comes from things like that, that you can't have by just being a smart friend. If you're sitting alone every morning, you're reading the scriptures, you're reminding yourself of the gospel, you're trying to remember that you're forgiven, trying to remember that you know, God loves you and that God has sent his son to die for you. There is, of course, and certainly there, help from the spirit and consolation to our soul. But you know, when someone else tells you that you are loved just because God loves you and that you're forgiven of these particular sins that other human eyes have seen and says, the blood of Christ washed all that away. There is a power to that that you can't get by just affirming that yourself. You know, this is the frustrating reality of the way that God has made us. And we have to kind of understand this is the way that we live. The greatest blessings of your life, the flourishing of your life can really only come as a result of grace. Grace from God, yes, directly by his power, directly through the effective call and the work of the Spirit, directly through all those things that God does to you, but also dependently upon other people. And this is why, this is why as a church, to get separated from God's people where his Spirit dwells and works that act of codependent love it really means you're going to dwindle away and die like a seed without a purpose. Meaning you have to live for the sake of both serving God and multiplying his grace to others. And then at the same time, the life of others working and sacrificing for your sake is the pathway to your health and happiness ultimately. In a couple ways, um, let me make that even more clear. If you are too stubborn to receive sacrificial love and charity and grace from others, you're not going to have much life in you. That's true theologically. If you don't want to accept God's charity of forgiveness and mercy and love, then you're going to get nowhere in life. You have to be able to be a passive, humble recipient of grace to just have life poured into you without doing anything to deserve it. You're just like dirt and God's putting life in because he cares. You have to be willing to have that spiritual attitude to life, to be like a child in the kingdom of God. But secondly, this, if you really want to flourish as a human, you have to humble yourself enough to accept charitable love from others, to be just someone's project, right? Um, I think especially as leaders, it's so easy to fall into this trap to think I'm a producer, not a receiver, I'm a giver of grace, not a taker of grace. And there's such a wild, just crazy pride to that. When God has created all of us to exist as just receptacles of grace that come from one another. Um, 
couple ways I think self-denial is going to work for us, right? One is this, personal piety. Uh, there is a sense in which there's a personal aspect of, uh, of seeking your own life and losing it, of hating one's own life or, or deprioritizing one's own life as their goal will keep it for eternal life. There is a personal salvific aspect to this, right? Um, you have to just obey in private. You have to do those things that God has called you to do when they don't seem particularly not doing what makes sense to you and what's easy for you and doing that which God has called you to just trusting in him. It's dying to your own self and your intuitions of, of, you know, at least what is helpful to you and simply resting on the word of God as your guide. But secondly, and this is, I think, even the more important thing, the whole idea here is missional living, right? Reproducing that life of Christ or replicating that life of Christ in others particularly in the way of self-sacrifice as a means to doing that. And here's how it goes. The glory of God leading to self-denial for the sake of multiplying life and fruit in others. Uh, let me just get a little personal here. You're never going to truly help somebody that you see as a tool in your life. As long as self-centered motivation to life is sort of the driving way you think about others, you will never actually help and serve others because you'll always see them as a tool. You'll always see them as an instrument to your own personal gratification and blessing. You'll always see them as a means for your own life. And you're never going to help anybody. You're never going to serve anybody. You know, as long as your boyfriend or girlfriend is primarily a means to personal happiness and fulfillment, you're never going to risk that relationship in order to truly help that person. You'll only sacrifice and serve that partner insofar as it leads to your own security and happiness, right? As long as they're just a vehicle for your own satisfaction. You'll only help them as much. But when it gets hard and it becomes costly to yourself, when it diminishes your personal happiness in that relationship, you're going to hands off. When you see yourself in the light of Christ as denying yourself for the glory of God, to grow the life of Christ in them, to, to increase the grace of their life, then you'll serve at personal cost, even when it means, at times, the stability and happiness of that relationship. As long as your coworkers are primarily a means of personal, professional advancement, if that's all they are, your boss is just an obstacle, your employees are tools, your coworkers are allies, then you're always going to put their humanity and need for Christ second to their function. You're, you're only going to risk so much. And to be honest, as culture gets more hostile, more and more hostile to, to the gospel, it's not going to be much. You're always going to be thinking whether you need that ally, that recommendation, that favor. But when you begin to think, Lord, you've put me into this life, into this workplace, into this family, for the sake of giving myself up that they might have life. It drastically reorients you in the way you think about them. I imagine, again, with wisdom, with prudence, you'd be willing to give up some jobs for a shot at blessing those people and relocating and doing whatever. Again, with wisdom, but you begin to think about your presence differently. As long as your children are primarily a reflection of your parenting and your devotion, how many of us do this, right? Our kids are basically our worksmanship and people judge that. Oh, you're a helicopter parent, you know, or you're, you're too disconnected or you don't discipline them or whatever. As long as you see your kids as a reflection of yourself, you might sacrifice the world for them, but it'll ultimately be for your own image. So you're going to focus on controlling their behavior instead of growing their hearts. Yeah. It's so easy to do this. But when you see your presence in their life as a, as a seed to grow the life of Christ in them, it gives you a tremendous kind of poise and care for their soul. Uh, 
let me end on just this, this last note. Uh, Christ cannot be just an example. And I think that's what we're prone to do, right? We're looking at this saying, okay, Jesus humbled himself. We ought to as well. Um, if he's only an example, here's a problem. He crushes you with that example. How close do you even touch self-sacrifice, self-denial for the sake of others? Almost zero compared to Jesus, right? Um, I know this is so easy to do. If we're finished with the sermon, just walk out and feel guilty and try harder, right? That's like kind of the, the end of it. Just don't feel happy about yourself and do better next time. Um, that's, a, that's an awful kind of sermon because the whole point of this that Jesus is making to his disciples is that he is doing this first. He is doing this himself. And it's not just to example for them a way to do it. He's saying, the life that I give to you is, your, is my gift to you that gives you life. You are that new grain. You are that new life that happens when I die. It's the precondition of being able to actually live self-denying and sacrificial. It's when you have life from another source. Do you guys get that idea? If you're empty and you're constantly trying to fill in that emptiness with outside things and outside acquisition and growth and achievement, then you're always going to be filling this bottomless hole inside of your heart, right? Just filling it in and leaking out. That's the fundamental human problem. But what he says is, the idea here is, if Christ gives you a brand new container, a brand new principle of life that cannot be exhausted humanly, it's a from heaven life. The way he describes it, it's an overflowing spring. It's wells of living water. It's, it's a living water inside of you. Look at all the images of it. It's never ending bread. It's never ending wine. It is a bottomless source of life. That's the source of being able to live in the new principle. It's no longer shrinking and dying and scrabbling for resources. It is like a grain growing. A grain never feels, a piece of wheat never feels poor for losing its seeds and for losing its, its, its parts because its whole life is now one of growth. That's the condition of giving away, is to actually be growing. But as long as you don't have Christ, you don't have that life in you, and you're just emptying all the time, then to lose something really means loss. But in Christ, our loss means life for others and ultimately for ourselves. You need life before you can reproduce it. And I want to promise to you from the scriptures that life is yours in Christ. It's the only way you'll give in such a way that blesses you. And that's the only way to be blessed if Christ's life is in you. You can have this by faith. Believe in the gospel. Repent of life. Trust and serve him. Let's pray. Lord God, we confess before you that in so many ways our life feels like the very opposite of giving up for the sake of your glory and for others. All of our thoughts, all of our prayers, so much of our time and our work and our money just goes to just this futile attempt to make ourselves happy, to fill in this emptiness inside of us. When life is ours for free as a gift, Lord, give us the faith to trust in Jesus as he is presented to us in the gospel. And in so doing, Lord God, to find life growing in us. May this life also lead to reproducing that life in others. Lord, simple acts of kindness and love, simple presentations of the gospel, prayers for our friends and family. Lord God, use us. Lord, multiply the fruit that we might bear for your kingdom. Lord, such was the life of Christ. And God, for this reason, he was glorified. Lord, do so with us according to our appointment. Lord, humble us that we might also share in his glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.